Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And uh, back from Russia, you are? I am. Yeah? And uh, had a great time. It was amazing. And I got a chance to spend a, a day or so in Moscow, went around Red Square, you know. Bought, I hate to say it, but I bought Russian nesting dolls for the girls. You know, ah. all, the, all the cliches, my friend. All the cliches. That's cool. Well, we recorded this show after recording Thursday's show where you really right. talked about it. So, we'll let people catch up with you there. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention that I had uh, an event here in New London called a Keto Mini Fest, which was a four-hour event that uh, 22 people came to. It was a uh, dinner, a cooking demonstration, a science talk, and a live Q&A all on the low carb thing. So, and, and, and it was really good food. I'm talking about sous vide salmon with uh, crispy skin taken off, fried crisp and laid on top. Nice. With a fennel salad and braised beef short ribs with a cauliflower steak with a little turmeric on it. I know you're getting all hungry and stuff. And uh, even yeah, you a, do this right before lunch. Like, you're killing me. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm sorry. It was absolutely delicious. We even did some uh, mini keto eclairs that nice. were just spectacular. So I just want to brag. You know, it was our first one that we did. This sort of mini version of Keto Fest, and uh, everybody loved it. It's almost like a pop up restaurant kind of thing, right? It's pop exactly what thing. it is. There's this space yeah, yeah. in town that is sort of opening as a restaurant on certain days to support itself, but mm -hmm. is a is a sort of an incubator kitchen where people can come and learn from a chef, the chef owner, how to do their own stuff, how to how to get their menu right, how to get the service and the flow and execution. So it's really an interesting space. RD eighty six is the name of it. I've just been having a ball. Yeah. It it seems to be very hip these days, that sort of experimental, you know, one night meal kind of thing come together around it. It's cool. How did you know the chef was from Brooklyn? <laughs> <laughs> however he doesn't have ironic facial hair so you know he may not be a complete hipster isn't all facial hair ironic no well, maybe nine's uh, not not yours <laughs> there you go i don't have that much irony in me <laughs> no all right anyway let's uh roll the music for better no framework <laughs> All right, dude, what do you got? Well, so this is an interesting article that the AppVNX guys dug up, which is uh, at effortless-serverless.com. So these are two serverless guys. They actually work on the Claudia JS project hmm. and uh, are lead developers and maintainers at Claudia Bot Builder. But anyway, the gist of the article is that by migrating a Node.js app to AWS Lambda, they can support a site that has 400,000 active users for about 100 bucks a month. Wow. Yeah. That's the kind of power that serverless architecture brings. Sure. And it doesn't matter, you know, if it's Amazon or, or, or Google or uh, Azure. I mean, going serverless makes economic sense. Well, and I, and I love this idea of creating bridges. Like, all right, so you've written some Node.js. Do you have to rewrite it to go serverless? Well, no. Right. right. That's, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's the way of thinking about the problem. I, I like that. And I think we should, we got to do more of that because everybody thinks that serverless is pretty much unique, that you're going to have to custom code for it. It's specific to the platform. Right. So interesting to start thinking in terms of, oh, I've got code here that I could migrate pretty easily to serverless. Exactly. So who's talking to us today, Richard? Well, I know we're talking to Laurent about some Xamarin stuff. So I was sticking around for some comments and, you know, builds coming up. Yeah. So I jumped back two years to show 1276 from March of 2016. And if you recall, that is the show we recorded with Nat and Miguel. Right. Our big scoop about Xamarin being acquired. And we actually recorded this show, I think, the week before Build and then published it literally as they made the announcement at Build. That was pretty awesome. And uh, that was a good day. I, I don't know how you feel about that day, <laughs> Carl. That, that was pretty fun. <laughs> it was a great day. And it's always fun to, you know, have a chance. Those guys really waxed poetic. Like they were very excited about the situation and they had been have not allowed to talk about it because, right. it, it, you know, it's SEC and stuff. This is publicly traded company. So to chat with us about it, in some ways, I felt like they were unloading. Like finally, they get to talk about it for a while. Mm. And there were lots of great comments. Admittedly, these comments are now, some of them are two years old. This particular one, I think, is remarkably prescient, especially coming into build. This is from Jeff Beery, okay. who says, I would also very much like to know more about the future plans to support both UWP and Xamarin. 
Yeah. For example, I wrote quite a bit of UWP model code using things like windows.web.htp.htp client <laughs> and other code from the windows.star.net namespace. It would be really great at this point if I could use Xamarin and project build this model code, but it has nothing to do with the UI, to a cross-platform Android and iOS solution. Yeah. However, right now I would have to rewrite all that code using system.star objects in order to make use of it in Xamarin. And if I did that, I would lose all the new goodness that Microsoft is baking into the windows.star branch of .NET. Right. It seems to me that Microsoft should converge these platforms now that they own Xamarin so that the developers can more easily write cross-platform UWP, Android, iOS, Mac, and still benefit from the new features that are baked into windows.star, all that UWP.net goodness. Hmm. Remarkably prescient. Of course, uh, Jeffrey, we will ask Laurent all about this, and I guarantee you he will not be able to say anything. <laughs> but, but they've already mentioned that, you know, in a perfect world, that's where everybody wants to be. Sure. That's and, XAML standard in a lot of respects, right, too, right. right? Although all of those initiatives are very challenging because you have UWP, you've got WPF, and you get Xamarin Forms, and they're not the same. Right. And when we ask Scott Hunter about it, he says, come to build. That's what he said. And pretty some- much, what else could I say to Jeffrey but, dude? Listen to build. Listen you're to gonna, build. You, you, hopefully, you listen to the show as soon as it publishes, so you know uh, that you hear it before Bill actually comes out. But I would lay odds there'd be some good stuff in the keynotes at Build. We don't know for, what. We don't know what. But it'll probably but be good. It's going to be exciting. Um, we have not recorded our shows to be published at Build shows yet, but we will. And then we really won't be able to talk about it till after Build. How about that? Yeah, right. So, Jeffrey, thank you so much for your comment at .NET Rocks Mug. It's on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks Mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet because they're serverless. <laughs> true. We definitely don't own the server. Yeah, they don't cost us a dime. <laughs> Actually, if they cost us a dime, we'd be in trouble, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I think we would be. <laughs> All right, let's bring Laurent back. Laurent Bignon works as Senior Global Azure Advocate for Microsoft after almost 10 years spent working for Identity Mine and Valorum, two leading firms in Microsoft technologies. He's one of the foremost experts in XAML and C Sharp based development. He codes in Windows, WPF, Xamarin, iOS, and Android, Unity, and ASP.NET. In his free time, Laurent writes for technical pubs such as MSDN Magazine and on his blog at blog.galasoft.ch. He's a frequent speaker at conferences such as Microsoft Mix, Build, TechEd, VS Live, Tech Days, and many other international events. Prior to joining Microsoft, Laurent was the Microsoft most valuable professional for Windows development from 27 to 2017, a regional director from 2013, and a Xamarin MVP from 2015. He's also the author of the well-known MVVM Lite open source framework for Windows, WPF, Xamarin, and the popular Pluralsight reference course about MVVM Lite. Man, when do you sleep? (laughs) <laughs> that is totally overrated. <laughs> it's the best 10 hours of the week. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was just listening to, to the show that you recorded with, um, with Michelle. Yeah. It was probably a, a few weeks back for, for you, but I just listened to it this morning. And uh, I think she pretty much said the same, except that as age comes, I think we tend to sleep a little bit more and to value our, our free time a little bit more than we used to. So that's good. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's not happening for me, man. I swear to goodness, I'm sleeping even less and uh, and not noticing it near as much. <laughs> I'm sleeping less too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this, this, you know, uh, I, the, the trip from Dev Intersection Orlando to Yakuks was actually two overnight flights. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah. Orlando, New York, New York to Moscow, that was an overnight then took a car between the two airports, because why not? And then flew overnight again, another six and a half hours from Moscow mm. to Yakutsk. Because yeah. Russia big. <laughs> <laughs> How many time zones in the Soviet Union? <laughs> oh, I think I visited <laughs> most of them, man. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it was. I was GMT plus nine there. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm just kind of amazed that this is only the third show we've done with you. We never did a show specifically about MVVM Lite, which is kind of embarrassing because 
It, really? You really started MVVM for a lot of us, I think. That was the first tool set I really looked at. Well, maybe this MVVM is a thing. Yeah, I was, um, I was also thinking about that. And that's why I, you know, I reached out to you and say, hey, we should do something at some point. It's true that, I mean, you and I speak a lot, right? I mean, we meet yeah. each other every, I don't know, like probably three, four, five times a year. Yeah. And so yeah. we speak a lot, but we never think of recording what we talk about. So, Which is yeah, a mistake. That's... Yeah. And, it, and I mean, here's the problem when, when you're friends with the rock stars is you forget what conversation you record and which ones you just had over beers. <laughs> yeah. That is correct. Yeah, I know. When you said we haven't done a show on MVVM one, I'm like, that what? That can't How is be. that possible? It's embarrassing. <laughs> I've, I mean, I've talked about it on the show. Sure, I've absolutely. Used it a lot. I mean, I even used it in my in my Xamarin Forms workshop. So it's just just great stuff, and it's easy. Yeah. And the light shouldn't be taken as you know light on features. It, it's it's a small footprint. That's all. Yeah, I guess um, the the goal is really to make it um, easy to use. And that's really what I want because um, I, I guess historically it came out from a from an attempt to make the life of the developers easier and especially around MVVM, which can require quite a lot of boilerplate code mm-hmm. and and a lot of repetition. And um, and so definitely you shouldn't have to spend too much time learning the the toolkit. And if you like parts of it you can use them if you don't like parts of it you can replace them quite easily with something else so that's kind of the whole philosophy behind that so update us on xamarin what's the latest over there yeah well you know uh, things uh, changed quite a lot for me in uh, in the sense that i joined microsoft about eight months ago now a little bit more than that i guess what's up with that <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was in August last year, and it was approximately a year ago I started talking to Microsoft about possibly joining. And uh, really, the the whole thing here is that there is a, a new team um, at Microsoft called the Cloud Europe Advocates, and uh, I, I know that you guys spoke to some of them already. So uh, the idea here is being um, a kind of new evangelism, but without the marketing part. And it's really all technical people and people coming from all kinds of communities. And so we are about 65 at this time. I think it keeps changing because we keep having um, you know new people on the team. Um, and out of those 65 people, some of them are more on, I don't know, containers and some of them do Java and some mm. of them do uh, Angular, JS or Node.js or JavaScript stuff. Mm. And uh, we have AI, ML, so artificial intelligence, machine learning. And uh, some of us do something more with Xamarin cross-platform. And I, of course, like to add Windows to the mix because... You know, if you want to be cross-platform, you you want Windows as well. And so um, we are four people on the team. We are not part of the Xamarin team. We are right. definitely Azure, and um, we are part of uh, what is called growth and ecosystem. So basically, uh, you know, I'm a few level under Scott Guthrie, <laughs> quite yeah. a few, but uh, it's still uh, it's still nice because Scott is very active on our on our teams and talking to us and uh, listening to us and. Uh, we have been doing quite a few uh, presentations with him. So it's really, really a, a cool team to be a part of. And so uh, even though I'm not part of the Xamarin team, I'm in touch with them quite a lot. And of course, we talk very often with, uh, you know, James Montemagno and Craig Dunn and uh, Joseph Hill and Miguel from time to time and uh, all those people and David Ortino on the Xamarin Forms team, of course. And so we try to create content and documentation and uh, samples and videos and speaking at conferences about Xamarin and especially especially Xamarin and Azure. So how, how those two ecosystems can interact to, to right. help create applications. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea. And so, uh, you know, Xamarin is uh, progressing fast. Uh, they keep adding new stuff. Um, Xamarin Forms is starting to be very, very interesting. And um, especially one thing I like very much now is that you have the possibility to mix um, Xamarin, which I would call the classic way of doing Xamarin, and the forms way. And uh, maybe a little bit of explanation is needed here. Uh, Historically, when you started developing for Xamarin, the idea is that you were sharing code, C sharp code, but the uh, the UI was kind of specific to the platforms that you were using. So, right. for example, you were using uh, XAML on Windows and um, storyboards, typically on iOS, 
and another kind of XML document on Android. And the uh, this UI was really um, totally indistinguishable from something that you would build f- with Java for Android or with Swift Objective-C for iOS because it's exactly the same UI, basically, right. same technology. And then came Xamarin Forms where... You're developing your UI once only, um, and then this UI is going to be rendered on the different platforms with native controls. So um, at some point, you had to do a choice. You had to say, okay, I want to go with Xamarin Forms, and then I have one UI, but then you have to do some kind of compromises about the UI and say, okay, for example, if I put, uh, I don't know, 20 pixels margin, it's going to look great on Android, but maybe not so great on on, on iOS, for example. Um, or you would go the uh, the classic way and say, okay, I'm going to totally customize the UI and have a, maybe a designer even work on the UI and do something which is super polished. Right. And so the great news is that now you can actually mix those two approaches. So you don't have to decide anymore. You can say, okay, I want some pages totally polished and, and I want other pages which are developed a little bit faster. So that's quite exciting. So you don't have to choose. You don't have to choose anymore. You can uh, do both in the same project, which is uh, which is a really cool approach. My good example for that, I would say, is if you define uh, like yeah, I don't know, you create a um, uh, you know a consumer facing application, so you want your pages to be really polished and beautiful and pixel perfect, both on iOS and Android, and and possibly on Windows. Uh, but then on the other hand, you have I don't know a contact form or the about page, or maybe you have uh, you know terms and conditions which nobody ever reads anyway. So right. uh, you probably don't want to spend too much time on those pages. Yeah, and uh, those can be done with forms, and then you just do the UI once and then it is uh, it is rendered on every platform. So it's a good approach. So that's, of course, pretty exciting, yeah. You could really dig into the stats of that. I'm wondering if you couldn't get 60, 70% of the stuff just as Xamarin forms and it's only these unique UIs where you really have to dig in and, and do custom controls. You probably could. In fact, a, a very good approach is to start with everything in Xamarin forms and like this, you have very fast, you have something which is running. Um, I always say, you know, sometimes you want to show that to your boss and say, yeah. hey, it's worth continuing to invest some money in the project. And so you do it in Xamarin forms. That also allows you to test your backend so in our case uh, azure Mm -hmm. typically and uh, make sure that everything's working fine and then later you can start refining pages and say okay now i have my my hero page you know the landing page where everybody's going to spend time this page we are going to do it with a designer with uh, you know native technology and make sure that everything's working great and and creating really great pages for the users so that's a that's a really cool approach and of course the other approach which uh, which has change our life for the better, I guess, is uh, .NET standard. And uh, I was listening to what you were saying before about compatibility and cross-platform and all that. And, uh, you know, .NET standard is a, is a great way to build compatible code and really not just for Xamarin, but the fact that Xamarin is included into that is fantastic because it allows you, uh, for example, one uh, scenario that you could use is uh, if you have a serverless backend like Azure Functions, which are great, for mobile applications because they are so simple to develop. Um, You can actually develop them with .NET standard, run them on uh, Linux, on Azure. Right. And uh, and then you can share some of the libraries, like, for example, your entities, etc. You can share the library directly into Xamarin Forms because or Xamarin uh, Classic because it is uh, based on .NET standard. And so that's really uh, opening the, the door to a world of compatibility, which is really awesome. Yeah, it's power. It's powerful stuff, and we, and we the docs don't show anything about standard two point one yet. But we did talk to, uh, to Scott Hunter about it. So there's clearly there's more things coming. Can you talk at all about XAML standard? I can't really, and uh, I I would prefer not to simply because I'm not on that team. Um, right. I'm an observer in this whole story. I was uh, an advisor uh, uh, when I was an MVP when I was outside of Microsoft. Um, I would say I continue to keep a good eye on that because um, I'm interested by my past uh, in checking what they are doing with that. Sure. And I think that having a um, you know a, a closer compatibility between those two worlds is a good idea. Um, however, I I also have a little bit of my doubts. You know, I worked for a very long time for a user experience firm, and we know that differentiating the UI 
is something which is very important. And certain firms can allow themselves to do a like a common UI on every platform, like Facebook, Twitter, you know, those big firms. Yes. Um, for other use cases, like smaller firms or for enterprise, etc., I think it's kind of better to really customize the UI for each platform, for iOS, for Android, for Windows. And this is why I love the, uh, the Xamarin approach, really, is when you say, okay, we are going to use you know, native controls and make sure that the UI is customized. Uh, XAML standard is definitely going to make life of people easier, but I I don't really consider that not having that was a huge obstacle, you know, because in the end, you you have to customize your UI anyway for the platform that you're working on. Right. Um, however, you know, every approach to compatibility, everything which brings people closer is a good thing. Xamarin in general is uh, having quite a lot of competition. I mean, we have, you know, all the hybrid scenarios where you use HTML as a, a as a UI, and then you have, uh, you know, Flutter, for example, uh, with Dart, right, uh, which is a Google project. Right. right. And you have Kotlin, maybe on Android, and then you have, of course, the, uh, the you know, the iOS with uh, Objective C and, and Swift and Android with Java, which is probably still now the majority of the project. So basically, those uh, those uh, this approach where you have multiple teams building applications one team per platform which is a i mean you know for us it sounds a little bit outdated but it is still how people do things probably for the most part it just find, and, strikes me um, as expensive that's my concern for most people is it you know they're looking at uh, running two teams one for ios and one for android it's just a lot of money yeah it is yeah and, and it's not just two teams but it's uh, two skill sets that you need to manage and so you know how do you educate people right when yeah. something else comes on the market uh, and and also uh, two tool chains right i mean it's not just about the, it's not just the languages which are different but the uh, de- development environment is different and so again you have to maintain that and you have to to think about what it costs but that said i i'm i don't have you know, metrics on that, but I think it's still the majority of the projects out there. And so we still have a lot of work to do, you know, to uh, try to convince people that having a cross-platform approach is a good idea. Um, and there is competition, but it is quite an exciting space. And uh, I recently came back from the MVP Summit and I hung out there with some people from the Xamarin team. And I can tell you that everybody is working hard on everything, be it, you know, Xamarin Classic, uh, being, uh, you know, the development environment, the uh, the tool chain. Uh, we'll have more exciting announcements at Build, which I can definitely not talk about, but really good stuff coming up. So it's uh, it's a very exciting space to be inside. And, uh, you know, everything's going mobile. Everything's going cross-platform. Uh, when you build applications, you want to be able to share code. And uh, nowadays, you have even the possibility to share code with the cloud, with Azure, with .NET standards, with Linux, with all that. So it, it's a great time to be a developer. For sure. Hold that thought for just one minute while we take a moment for this very important message. Hey, guess what, Rockheads? Progress Telerik wants to send someone to build. So they're having a contest. Step one is to sign up and learn about the new innovative modern UI tools they'll be announcing at Build. By registering, you'll be entered to win a full conference pass to Microsoft Build, plus a $500 travel stipend. They're also giving away three Telerik DevCraft UI licenses. And for .NET Rocks listeners, they'll also be giving away a Telerik DevCraft UI license every week. All you have to do is register at buildcontest.pwop.me. That's buildcontest.pwop.me. Progress offers the leading platform for developing and deploying mission-critical business applications. The creator of the award-winning Telerik.net and Kendo UI, JavaScript user interface components and controls, reporting solutions, and productivity tools, Progress offers all the tools developers need to build high-performant modern apps with outstanding UI. Go now to buildcontest.pwop.me and sign up to win. We're back. .NET Rocks. Carl Franklin here. Richard Campbell's over in Canada. And uh, Laurent Bignon is here. We're talking about the latest in Xamarin. Um, the Xamarin tools in Visual Studio are getting revved. You know, Visual Studio is getting updated on uh, at an alarming rate. <laughs> and uh, sometimes <laughs> the tools kind of fail to keep up with uh, those releases. And I've, I've noticed this personally lately. 
Is is that a particular challenge to the Xamarin team that Visual Studio pushes out these updates? Every, what are we once a quarter now? I don't really think it's a particular challenge for the Xamarin team because they have um, already had a, a very fast cadence before. So even before Xamarin was acquired and there was an integration in Visual Studio, they had different channels. Um, and they had a, an alpha channel, for example. They had a beta and they had a stable channel. And now those channels are not there anymore per se, but you can still have a preview version of Xamarin. So it's pretty much developed out of band and there is an integration in Visual Studio. That said, um, the, um, there are definitely challenges. One challenge is, of course, every time that C-sharp changes, right? Because right. Xamarin is using C-sharp. And so all the tools, uh, you know, the IntelliSense and all that, uh, needs, of course, to work. Um, then they have, of course, uh, you know, the issue that they have uh, XAML and they have their own version of XAML, like we mentioned before. And so there is some IntelliSense going on with that as well. And there is Roslyn under under the cover. And so that's, of course, pretty complex. And the tool chain in general is very complex. I mean, if you consider that you still need a Mac to develop for, for iOS, and if you are using Visual Studio on Windows, there is a communication going on with the Mac uh, over the network. And so that's a very complex tool chain. So uh, this is where we see sometimes some issues. Um, there are still, you know, work to be done on the on the tools. I'm saying that, you know, in all honesty, I think that um, there is some stability issues from time to time that we need to address. And when I say we, I, again, right, I'm not part of that team, but I'm, I, I see how they work and I can tell you they do really amazing work there. Um, so there is work to be done for sure. But in general, I think that we came a long way and uh, nowadays you can really develop in a nice manner. I happen to have my Surface Pro as my main tool. And so that's a, a Windows PC and I have a Mac, which is, you know, on my network. And I, most of the time, I don't even need to touch it. It's just, you know, Visual Studio is going to connect to that. Uh, it's going to build, it's going to bring back everything I need on the PC. And I can also use a simulator uh, the iOS simulator directly on my PC as well. Uh, I have touch screen, which of course on the Mac you don't. So it's a, it's a nice feature of the, um, of running the iOS simulator, uh, which under the cover runs on the Mac, but it is brought back to the Windows PC through remoting. So there are all these kind of, um, of touches which make our life easier as developers. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice environment to, to work with. Uh, recently, we also released the uh, Xamarin Live Player. Uh, it's a, a system where you can run applications from a Windows PC to an iOS device or an Android device without the need to have a Mac anymore. And um, that's a nice added value, especially to develop UI. Um, when you do your XAML, you can basically push this XAML to a device without having to build uh, just by saving the document, it's going to be pushed to the device. It's going to appear on your iOS device or, or your Android device. And then you can do your design like that in a very iterative manner, very fast. And um, that's, uh, that's a, a nice feature. So I think we'll see more of that going on. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, definitely some challenges because the tool chain is pretty complex. And, you know, when you build... Uh, I mean, one thing which is really cool with Xamarin is that they... For maximum performance, they use the same mechanisms than Android use, you know, for Android devices with Java and iOS or Apple uses for iOS devices. So they do the same type of compilation, um, you know, ahead of time compilation for iOS and just in time compilation for Android. So even just that or even just linking to actually use the uh, the native components, the native controls and all that, that's pretty, you know, pretty beefy under the covers. And uh, I'm always amazed at what Miguel and his team achieved because it's, uh, and it's pretty unique, right? If you see the other cross-platform um, frameworks than we have, it's either hybrid and then you have a kind of an HTML UI, which is faking being a native UI, or you have the Flutter approach where they are also painting everything on the screen. So basically, they don't use native controls either, right? They are simulating that. Right. And Xamarin is really the only one which is using actual native controls, but still giving you some cross-platform compatibility. So there is a, a pretty interesting technical feat behind that, right? And we did do a show on Flutter. I mean, it's interesting to mm -hmm. see 
it's to me the fact that Flutter exists is just proof that the cross-platform solution isn't settled. Like we're still not happy. That is correct with how to build. Uh, to ha- how to have one team building both iOS and Android and making good products on both platforms and not suffering for it. Yeah, no, that is correct. And I, I think that Flutter is definitely interesting to look at. Um, I, My estimation, I was just talking about that with um, some people from my team just before, and uh, we, we tried it out. And I think it's something that we want to keep an eye on because competition is always interesting, whatever competition it is, right? Um, I think that they probably answer a different question than Xamarin does. And also, it's a very young solution, right? So they definitely need to mature, and, and, but definitely interesting keeping an eye on it. Their approach is quite different in the sense that, like I said, right, they are, they are not really using native control. So they do cross-platform, right. but it's not, a, uh, it's not a native UI in the end, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so that's a, that's a very different approach. That said, I'm, I know some of the people on that team, and those are clever people, so I'm pretty sure that they have some good stuff coming up. So I want to definitely keep an eye on that. Um, I still think that Xamarin is a unique approach, and uh, as such, it's you know interesting to, to promote. Um, one thing which is true is that some people will never use Xamarin because it's Microsoft offering. So that is definitely something which uh, you know explains why competition is still there for sure. Uh, but apart from that, I mean, uh, yes, definitely there are different questions that you can answer with different technologies and different frameworks. And uh, yeah, we are absolutely looking at Flur and we are looking at uh, you know hybrid solutions as well. And there is also Kotlin on the Android side, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those are all solutions that are interesting. In their own way absolutely and uh it, it's i feel like xamarin in the past two years is one of the reasons i read that comment from the acquisition point going forward i mean that's also when dot net core really came to be and so they replaced their c-sharp compiler with the Roslyn one and the framework mm. itself like mm. they've really in, I, w- I would feel like in the past two years they've just had to refit all of Xamarin with this existing code base, the, the stuff that was already being built. It's amazing that they move forward at the same time. You know, it's an amazing feat that they did that. And it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting because if you consider that Xamarin built all that without being part of Microsoft, what it means yes. is that they didn't even open .NET. They didn't check it out. They didn't look no. at the source, even when it was open source, right? Yes. Because they just couldn't for you know intellectual property reasons. So they couldn't yeah. even read the code. And so they had to reproduce all that. And I, I kind of wonder you know, what, what feeling that was when they replaced that because now they are part of Microsoft and they can do that and they replace it with the official you know, C-Sharp compiler, Roslyn. Well, and, and you when know, I uh, opened our source that stuff, I remember talking to Miguel because, I, you know, Strange Loop, one of the, my projects, my companies, we used Mono under the hood and we stressed Mono mm-hmm. in a way that made its garbage collection very unhappy. And at one point, I had my senior team on the phone with Miguel and he's like, yeah, what you guys are doing, that's really hard on the garbage collector. So the, one of the first things he said when, when all that got open, when .NET went open source with Core was, I need to look at that garbage collector. Because it's mm-hmm. one of those incredibly hard problems at load and at scale that you, you, you have to see the code to understand how sophisticated it actually is. Just how yeah. intelligent. Like those, the guys like, then of course, I'm in the middle of writing the history of .NET. So I've had a chance to talk to some of these folks. Like guys like Patrick Desaad and, you know, they're mm-hmm. not well-known names, but they are some of the smartest people in this very rarefied atmosphere mm, yeah. of of doing non-deterministic memory management and, and, and just-in-time compilation and so forth. It, 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 those are rare skills. And, and the fact that a guy like Miguel and that team all those years never got the garbage collector where they wanted it to be is just sort mm-hmm. of a proof point. That being said, mm. and not to steal too much thunder here, but, you know, Blazor is where it's at right now, this, you know, mm-hmm. razor for the browser because of the mono code base and it's still being written in C++. So that they were actually able to port it in through WebAssembly, which you couldn't do with Rosalind. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and by the way, you mentioned Blazor, and there is also um, a, another project which is really interesting, um, which is called, I don't know how to pronounce that, but OWI, I guess. Um, and so this is basically, uh, uh, Frank Kruger is uh, one of, you know, Microsoft and Xamarin's partner and working a lot on Xamarin Forms projects and all that. And that's a very clever guy. And he uh, basically built a Xamarin Forms I don't know how to qualify that. I guess it's uh, it's a target, if you want, mm. where it's basically running on WebAssembly and on the web. And so what it does, uh, where Blazor is using HTML as a UI, um, what uh, this new project does is basically uh, using the Xamarin form XAML and rendering that in a way that works on the web and with C Sharp under the cover and running all that on WebAssembly. And so this is a space which is super exciting for me. So, uh, you know, same Blazor and, and OE. Um, uh, this is something that I find very interesting and uh, especially, you know, being uh, an old civil light developer and I said the S word. I, uh. I don't know if you have to beep that or what or, or if it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically, do the Swiss uh, you know, actually what, swear? I don't think the Swiss actually swear. <laughs> no, we but we do, we do, yeah. And and plus, you know, swearing in Swiss German is like double swearing, right? So, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's like a Swiss you know. and hawk a loogie in the process. Oh right. my god, yes. And um, so anyway, um, it's a, it's a really interesting um, endeavor there, and, and I love that because uh, you know that's pretty much what we try to do back then with Silverlight, and except that you know sometimes I joke about it, I say well it's done in the in the right way. It's not a plugin; it's directly integrated in the browser, and then you can run some rich code, and you don't have to worry about JavaScript too much, which you know a lot of us don't have the energy anymore to do that. I guess right. And and then you have uh, possibly a, a UI which will be rich enough. I'm I'm not a super huge fan of HTML for applications, but if you can express some of the concepts in XAML and then have that rendered on the web, I mean this is a space which is really exciting now. And so I think that we are just at the beginning of the cross-platform you know, the, the cross-platform story. But to go back to your uh, garbage collector story, you know, when I started interacting with Microsoft was uh, when I was still working with Siemens and I'm talking, you know, like 10, 15 years ago. And we were talking to those guys, the garbage collector guys, because we were doing stuff where the garbage collector was not fast enough or it was the fact that it was non-deterministic, that it was firing at times where we couldn't really control was right. a big issue for example, at the time. And I'm amazed. I mean, this is such a difficult and complex problem to solve that, you know, nowadays they still improve it and they still <laughs> manage to to add stuff even 15 years later, right? This is a pretty incredible story, I guess. I agree. Mm. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? It must be that happy time again. Yeah, it's time to float a new slogan balloon. Xamarin, more fun than a barrel of monos. <laughs> <laughs> oh it's a double pun oh ah, be still my heart i love it it's not bad i'm so happy it's actually That's brilliant it's actually time to give away a d experience subscription from our friends at dev express to one lucky member of the dotnet rocks fan club you know everyone knows that dev express has great desktop controls but their web tools are simply amazing they have this collection of HTML5 JavaScript controls called Dev Extreme. And at the heart of this product line are these really powerful controls like grid, chart, pivot grid, tree list, and scheduler. But Dev Extreme also comes with more than 50 touch optimized client side controls data visualizers, navigators, editors, lists, dialogues, and notification controls, and general purpose controls like a filter builder, range slider, file uploader, scroll view, and more. And since they're all HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS, they include integrations with things like jQuery, Knockout, React, Ionic, and Angular. Plus, DevExtreme controls come with ASP.NET MVC and ASP.NET Core wrappers, so they're infinitely flexible. But don't take our word for it. Go for a test drive now at dx.netrocks.com. That's dx.netrocks.com. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner, Richard, is Chris Jasper. Congratulations, Chris. I hear clappers. That's the clappers. You got the clappers, sir. 
And uh, congratulations, Chris. You just won a D Experience subscription, a big pile of awesome from our friends at Dev Express, just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to join, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join up. We have thousands of members all over the world, and every show we like to give away stuff from our sponsors, and every December we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club. But you have to sign up to win. All right, Laurent, it's been a while, but uh, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology, what would you buy? Yes. So, you know, I guess really my main issue is not really the money these days. It's really the time. So can I buy time instead? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good idea. You know, the, the, the issue is, um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of drones and I have a DJI Mavic Pro and I love it so much. And yeah. I try to take it when I travel and, you know, except if it's in a country where the regulations are crazy. But I mean, generally, I really try to take it everywhere. And my big issue is that I just don't have time to edit those videos. You know, I love taking videos. I have gigabytes or probably terabytes of uh, raw content and it takes just so much time to put them together so these days i do more photography because it's faster to edit i guess right but yeah i wish i had more time that said if you give me five thousand bucks i would probably buy more drones because you can never have <laughs> many drones right but paying mm-hmm. an editor to d- edit those up for you you know you could make a lot of video for five grand mm. Yeah, so. I guess um, that might be a possibility, but who has a pleasure in that, right? <laughs> I yeah. don't well, know. skill, it's, you know, you. I've seen some of your videos, Laurent. They're lovely. Yeah, they are. But, Thanks. But ed- editing isn't easy. It takes time. You love shooting this stuff, but making it into something that other people can watch is, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it's, I, we've had it before. Someone say, like, I'd get an, I'd get an assistant. Like, right. you're right. Getting yep. time. That's the, the that is the only real constrained resource it seems these days. Yeah, hire an assistant. Mm-hmm. Sure, all about time. No, it's so. a it's an interesting idea. I might uh, try to find someone. I I was already looking at people helping me to uh, edit videos, like the the video I do for work, for example, and sure. these kind of things. And uh, yeah, it's true. It takes some time. It's uh, it's an interesting process. I kind of like it because I find it kind of relaxing and soothing. You know, you're you can get in the zone and you you know you you edit your stuff and it's nice but yeah it is so time consuming and the problem is that if you're a perfectionist like i am i you know your life is ruined right <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, you know you, yeah you have to do it the way you got to do it and it's its own kind of insanity there's no toys about that yeah definitely it is correct yeah hey i did look up the uh the we web framework uh mm-hmm. from frank krueger and uh, it mm-hmm. is pronounced we Okay, so that's good so, to know. Yeah. Um, I saw it written uh, many times, and I, I realized that I probably never talked the word. But uh, it, it's a really interesting stuff. And by the way, one of my good friends, uh, Jan Hanneman, who is uh, in, in Vancouver, and well, Vancouver Island, actually, he's in, uh, in Victoria. Um, he actually put together a sample with MVVM Lite. So since we have MVVM Lite now on .NET standard, you can actually use it with Wii and build applications running in the browser, um, you know, in an MVVM manner. So it's really interesting. I, I want to experiment more with that. And, uh, and definitely, uh, if there are any improvements I can do to make that easier to use, I- I'd love to do that because it sounds like a very exciting proposition. We seems very interesting. Like, I think we probably need to do a show around it because he's also got a version that it, uh, packages into WebAssembly. So this might be another, this is running Xamarin Forms in yep. the browser as a WebAssembly. That's, that's a big that deal. That's correct. That's a big deal, yeah. Yeah, that's no. a huge deal, yeah. What are some of the mm-hmm. projects that you've done with Xamarin that you're uh, proud of and that you show off a lot? Um, I would say we we did quite a lot of work, um, especially around media streaming. And um, for example, some people don't know that, but a lot of the top boxes that you have on television uh, are actually running Android under the cover. Mm. And um, since oh, yeah. it's running Android, basically you can develop for them using Xamarin because whatever is running Android or whatever is using iOS, you can develop for it using Xamarin. So it's not just for phones, right? It's also for, you know, a lot of uh, other devices like Apple Watch, for example, would work or, you know, if you have a Samsung Gear or, you know, any other type of uh, of Android-based wearable, for example, that would work. And so I, I really like the um, working with uh, television 
networks yeah. when I was back then still working for identity mine and Valorem. Um, and uh, those are things that people use a lot all day long and you need to have a nice user experience and the streaming is its own set of interesting challenges and so sure. we had some people who were kind of you know dedicated to this to making the streaming work basically and that was sometimes uh, challenging but uh, and that's not just because of xamarin right it's just streaming in general with all the codecs sure. and all those uh, stories that's that's really complicated but that was fun um and so we did um because it was cross-platform, we did, for example, some applications for Animal Planet in the days uh, running on Amazon Fire TV, which is also running Android. And uh, this was a collaboration that I did back then with the, uh, the team who was doing the same application for Xbox. Right. And so basically, we had a, a cross-platform application on Xbox on one end and on uh, Amazon Fire TV on the other end. Uh, we did quite a lot of uh, top box applications where you have those uh, TV guides and then you have to scroll through them. And so you have scrolling vertically and scrolling horizontally. And there are um, you know, a whole s- lot of challenges there if you want to perform well. Um, so that was fun. Um, the last project I did before, the last Xamarin project I did, I should say, uh, before um, coming to Microsoft was the, uh, the application for the Zurich Airport. Yeah, that was a great application. The HoloLens? Uh, no, 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 no. The Zurich Airport uh, on Xamarin, so on Android and iOS. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, that was a project that I worked on. We did some some work uh, on HoloLens as well, and that was not specifically for Zurich Airport, but for you know aviation in general. Um, mm. And so this uh, this application for the Zurich Airport, the Xamarin one. Uh, it's basically the application that you can download when you land in Zurich, and then it gives you all kinds of information about, uh, you know, the uh, public transportation system and the arrival and departure and the gate and time and security and all that. And it was a very challenging application uh, from a, uh, a features perspective because it was very rich. Right. Um, and we did that uh, at the same time on Android and iOS, and it was it was very fun. So yeah, uh, quite a, quite a few interesting applications. These days, I don't really code for production anymore. I don't have clients anymore, which is both a little bit of regret and a relief because working with clients is hard, but at the same time, (laughs) (laughs) you know, it's kind of what we do, right? I mean, we, at the end, you want people to use your stuff. So I I work more with communities and developers and trying to teach them on, you know, how to use our, our stuff and the, uh, both on the Xamarin side and the Azure side. Um, but I continue to do, um, you know, fun applications. The latest app I develop with Xamarin is a cognitive service application where I'm just pointing it in fruits and then it's recognizing if it's an apple, an orange, a banana. You know, these kind of things are, are so much fun to use. And it's surprisingly easy. Uh, you know, the this application, I'm, I'm showing a sample where basically in like 15 minutes, we build it from scratch and... Uh, it's uh, it's absolutely possible to do that, and those are models that you can train. So those are really, you know, real AI models that you can train, that you can specialize if you want to recognize spots for a motorbike, for example, or wow. I don't know things like that. You you can do that as well. So this is really exciting. It is really exciting, and uh, I know you can't talk about things in the future, but what's your wish list? Like, what's on your wish list for things that you wish were better, easier, more powerful, or just there as features of Xamarin? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, so some of my wish list is going to come out at build. So I'm really happy about that. So I, again, I can't mention that at all. I, well, I that's guess a good I w- sign, though, isn't it? That these things <laughs> were on your wish list and they're coming out at build. That's a great sign. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I can I cannot take credit for that. I guess it was a wish list from many people, and and probably from people higher up than myself in the food chain. So, <laughs> you know, but but that stuff is really exciting. So yeah, build is going to be fun uh, in, in that regard. Um, I guess that anything that makes development easier and faster is something I want. And right. so if we can have uh, you know, be it on the UI level, be it on the uh, on the backend code. Um, you know, having some stuff which allows us to communicate faster with the Mac, for example, for building iOS or anything which speeds up, you know, development and uh, and building times and debugging and making sure that we have, uh, you know, error messages which actually talk to us and explain what what the error actually is. <laughs> All that is really complex because under the cover, you're dealing with unmanaged 
systems and those are typically you know c plus plus or or worse <laughs> right right um and, and so the error messages that you get are sometimes very, very difficult to understand because those devices need to be hardware accelerated tremendously so that you can run very complex application on something that is in your pocket, right? Or on your wrist if it's a, if it's a watch, even worse. And, and so that's complex. But that said, if we could have, um, anything that makes life of the developer easier is really what I want to have. So part of my, you know, my goal, I guess, in having joined Microsoft is teaching people and trying to help them understand better how they can use those tools. And on the other hand, for myself, my wish list, I wish that the tools were supporting me even better than they do already. Uh, we are you know, already blessed with Microsoft and, and Visual Studio, honestly, because, oh my God, right? Such, right. A, such a tremendous power that we have, but the tools can always get better. And so I, I wish we had, uh, we had that, yeah. Yeah, and I do hope you're getting feedback from folks out in the field that you were able to push back to the product teams now being all the that time. And that's part of, yeah, that is definitely part of uh, of why they hired me. That we have you know a good contact with our respective communities, all the cloud developer advocates, and um, and we have great um, great link with the Xamarin team, with the Visual Studio team, with the you know the Azure teams, and all that. And so we definitely try to you know, reach out to them. And now I have access to the uh, global address list, you know, the gal. And so that's really cool because I can uh, easily locate people and try to talk to them. And, uh, and you know, what I notice is that the, the teams in general, they are really interested in making life of the developer easier and better. Right. And, uh, and the only reason why sometimes they cannot always respond to all the feedback is that there is so much feedback and there is so much to do when they are really heads down on the next feature and the next, uh, you know, stabilization and the next bug fix and all that. And so having our team is really helping them to unload some of that on our shoulders. And we can do that. We can talk to people, to the community and all that. And uh, and we can try to filter that and, and direct it to the right person. And I think it's a, it's a good place to be and, uh, and you know, to help the teams really uh, being more productive and, and more efficient. Awesome, dude. And, and it is absolutely yeah. an exciting time. And stuff like we, like it, it all, there's, there's just seemed to be a pointer here between are we going to do all our clients in HTML or are we going to do all our clients in XAML? And I, I don't know what the answer is, but it definitely seems like we're tooling up to provide that option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the answer is probably to be it's probably going to be hybrid, right? <laughs> in sense, uh, hybrid in the sense, uh, you know, some people are going to do one thing, some people are going to do the other thing. I, I think if we learned anything from the, uh, uh, I don't know, in in my case, twenty years that we've been doing development, is that there is not one answer, and you can try to tell people right ones and run everywhere. In the end, it just doesn't quite work it's kind of and a lie just, it's a lie we want to be true but it's still yeah. a lie <laughs> it is yeah and and really we tried so many times and it's still you know it's still not quite there and so i think that having a solution where you have the possibility to build something which is platform specific with the maximum you know amount of code that you share and having the possibility to customize for a given platform is probably where it's going to be even in five or ten years and WebAssembly is a very exciting way and the mere fact that just in the microsoft ecosystem not even talking about others right but just in the microsoft ecosystem we already have two different projects you know experimenting on that like blazor on one hand and uh, which is a uh, you know coming from a microsoft uh, team and and frank who is not working for Microsoft per se, but really collaborating with Microsoft a lot. Uh, that's really exciting. And it shows that there is a lot of uh, innovation coming our way. And I I'm really excited to see that. Excellent. Awesome stuff. Laurent, thank you for continuing to do awesome things. I mean, not just with Xamarin, but uh, all of the apps that you're dem demonstrating with HoloLens and all this great technology that you guys have done. And, uh, and congratulations on your new uh, position at Microsoft. And man, I can't wait to see Build. I can't wait. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll be there, and uh, it's all the um, many of the cloud developer advocates are going to be there. So it's also a good occasion to meet us and to talk to us. Excellent. For sure. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks.
Net Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a...